Hello, and welcome to Memory Lane, Revisiting Precious Stones. My name is Elizabeth Rosner, and I am the Director of Development here at Silk Road Rising. Today, we'll be looking back at Silk Road Rising's very first stage production, Precious Stones, which opened 20 years ago in January 2003. We're joined today by Silk Road Rising's co-executive artistic director and the playwright of Precious Stones, Jamil Khoury, Professor Malik Najjar, who directed Precious Stones, and Roxanne Asaflin and Nicole Pittman, who starred in the production. Welcome, everyone. Precious Stones boldly examines the Israeli-Palestinian conflict in the safe yet turbulent terrain of American diaspora. Set in Chicago in 1989, two women, one Jewish and one Palestinian, join forces to organize an Arab-Jewish dialogue group, only to find themselves falling in love. As they each cross enemy lines, they stumble upon the disputed territories of sexuality and class. So let's get started. Jamil, I'd love to begin by asking you what inspired you to write Precious Stones? Oh, wow. So I had started writing Precious Stones probably, I want to say four or even five years before our production in 2003. I had wanted to do a project about Israel-Palestine for some time, and I was really kind of, you know, pulling from the various threads, my experiences uh, living in Palestine in 1989 during the first Intifada, working for the United Nations Relief and Works Agency, uh, and involvement with activism, uh, Palestinian justice activism, and so forth, uh, you know, in the United States, both prior to that and, uh, and after my, my return to the States. Uh, and, and the fact that, you know, I had been so influenced um, along the way by, by women and the activism of, uh, of, of Palestinian women and Israeli women, Jewish American women around these issues of <clears throat> peace and justice and some kind, of, some kind of resolution to this, you know, seemingly uh, unending uh, conflict. And so, you know, kind of... Um, pulling from the hundreds, if not thousands of conversations over the years and um, really interesting work that I saw on the ground and, um, you know, work, work that was being, you know, stuff that was being written and just put out into the larger discourse. Um, I wanted to uh, tell a very personal story that was able to connect um, politics that I care very deeply about. So uh, politics of, you know, conflict resolution and justice and around sexual politics and identity, uh, questions of, of socioeconomic class, culture, belonging, um, what it means to be in diaspora. So questions that I, I uh, we are still grappling with, you know, probably uh, all, all the time. And, and this story revealed itself over time um, as, you know, a way to, you know, once again, tie those, those threads in, in a way that would invite an audience uh, into these conversations, but also hopefully compel them to go out and learn more uh, or to somehow become involved. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, we, uh, we were able to uh, produce this play. We were able to bring it to uh, college campuses, and uh, it is now in an anthology that uh, that Malik uh, Malik Najjar edited. Uh, so it it continues to to have a life and have a reach. And and for all of that, I could not be more grateful. Uh, and and certainly, it's the people on the this call. Uh, who who brought that to life and you know really breathed that life into uh, the, the characters created and uh, and you know the 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 the, the tensions and difficult um, uh, questions that they were they were coping with. Thank you for that. Um, and we know that Precious Stones has had a successful run and that it continues to be popular even today and 
has continued impact. But I'd like to follow up and for you, ask you to take us back to 2003. So you and Malik had just founded Silk Road Rising, then called Silk Road Theater Project. Um, so could you share with us uh, what compelled you to produce Precious Stones as Silk Road Theater Project's first stage production? So I entered a playwriting contest uh, or a script contest, and it was being run by what was then called the Chicago's uh, Department of Cultural Affairs. It's today the Department of Cultural Affairs and Special Events. And I, uh, I, I just assumed my play would not be selected. <laughs> so, um, you know, submitted the script and uh, uh, and they selected five plays and, and lo and behold, uh, Precious Stones was one of them. Now, there was a bit of a stipulation uh, that was tied to the submission process that I didn't really, uh, you know, pay a lot of attention to because once again, I thought, oh, you know, all these scripts are being submitted and yeah. So, and that was that um, the, every submission had to be linked to a nonprofit producing entity. So Malik and I had already started imagining Silk Road Theater Project and a mission and, you know, kind of a vision for a company. But then all of a sudden they said, uh, we've selected your play um, and, you know, is your company ready to produce it? And we were sort of like, uh, well, uh, maybe. <laughs> so we just scrambled and were in many ways forced to um, accelerate the process of, of creating a company, a website, you know, all of that. Uh, we were fortunate in that we found a, a fiscal sponsor to sort of carry us over as a 501c3 nonprofit as ours was in, in process. Um, and uh, and we, we produced the play under the umbrella of, of Silk Road Theater Project. So, um, you know, had we not won this contest, uh, I have no idea, you know, uh, you know how 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 quickly or or not we would have moved on the uh, on the theater develop, development process. But they actually like they gave us dates. They gave us a framework. Like this is when we want your play to be produced. So you know the rest is kind of history, um, and I'm I'm so grateful for. Uh, for for that opportunity and and once again it was a complete shot in the dark and I don't I don't I think I think a friend of someone had encouraged me they're like you know there's this contest and I know you've been working on this play and you've been like bringing people together to read it and you know and 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 Malik and I had been in in conversations about the play and uh, and I I'm I'm so grateful I do not remember who that nudge came from but I'm really grateful. <laughs> that I was nudged. That's incredible. <laughs> um, thank you for sharing that, Jamil. Who could have imagined that, you know, through this series of events, right, that we would be here 20 years later talking about this very um, production and talking about your work. Um, thank you for sharing. So now that the stage has been set, unintended. Uh, I'd like to turn to Roxanne, Nicole, and Malik. So um, I'd love to hear from you. So what drew you to Precious Stones? What made you want to be a part of this production? Well, I had just begun my master's degree at the venerable Medill School of Journalism at Northwestern University, having been inspired to formalize my training as a journalist not that I didn't already have an undergraduate degree in journalism, I did. And I used it when I moved to the West Bank. I moved to Palestine in order to report on what was really happening there because I had this epiphany. It happened to be January 1st, just about the time of the epiphany, biblically speaking, when um, a singing job came my way and that church choir had gone to the Holy Land they found out that as Americans, they had been told something that wasn't true about this ongoing conflict between the Palestinians and the Israelis. And as a Palestinian American, it could have gone either way. As an American, 
I'd like to go there and prove that this church choir got the story wrong, that the United States is always the victor because they're the, the liberator abroad. And they're, um, you know, the valor comes from the courage that's driven by virtue. Alternatively, I could find that these church choir people were right, that the US mainstream corporate driven media were in fact telling untruths and leaving important pieces out. And the conflict is not at all the way most Americans thought it was. And so I moved there six months later and was a journalist and wrote for the Washington Report on Middle East Affairs magazine. And then when I came back, completely convinced that the choir had it right, I got my master's degree so that I could go into the classroom and teach young people to be a little bit critical and keep an open eye when taking in mainstream media information and to understand how those messages are crafted based on political uh, motivations. And so that's, um, that was my goal in life, with getting a very expensive master's degree that would probably never pay back in dividends financially, but that it would give me satisfaction to enlighten people the way I had suddenly been enlightened. I thought it was gonna be an easier lift the mainstream than it was. Most people will hear you saying something contrary to the prevailing ideas and just be like, well, okay, but it's not my issue. I'm going to go. That's not the hill I'm going to die on. But the students, they were different. A lot of students actually changed their own courses in life to get on this topic. And that's why it's a little bit easier today to talk openly and have a robust dialogue, not unlike that which has been possible in Israel for decades. In the United States, it's still a, a third rail issue, but stu college students, I think, have been driving this issue to the fore for a long time now, and college professors like Michael Najjar, Malik Najjar, are the reason you can have this dialogue in a setting that is often trying to shut it down. Jamil is another example of somebody who is bringing conversation to the fore that most uh, in the powerful realm try to shut down and they have the power to shut it down. So I wanted to make sure it didn't get shut down. And that was my inspiration. What about other people to this question? What about you, Nikki? Well, I came at it from a, a completely different perspective and I'm just like, Oh, Roxanne, I just want to live in your body sometimes. Um, but uh, um, I, you know, I'd taken a year off from my teaching job and I was teaching theater full time and I was auditioning and, and working all around the city. And um, this, this popped up on my audition radar. And so I, I came to an audition and, and in this time I was going through a lot of personal stuff you know i was um i had been in a 10-year relationship with a woman and i was leaving because i wasn't didn't know i was if i was really a lesbian and i always tried really hard to be one but it didn't work out <laughs> and um and i was really you know i'm jewish but i it always felt like i was jewish and was really struggling with how i wanted to be a jew and um and i didn't know a lot you know i just knew that we that the the israeli palestinian conflict had been going on for so long and i never understood it i never um as a jew it was always really hard for me to understand how we could be doing something to a people that had we had been so persecuted as a, as jews so all these things were kind of here and i came to audition for this piece and i think i fell in love with Jamil and Malik. <laughs> I think that's what happened is, is, is having a conversation with them at the audition about this, that it was more than just about the acting. It was, it was, it was much deeper. And so I was really intrigued and I was really just joyful that, um, that, that they offered me the part and I really had no clue what it would bring for me. And I, I feel so, um, always so grateful for that, but that's how I, 
I can talk forever about this, but, um, but that's how I came to it. And that was, that really started my journey of really trying to get to a deeper understanding of the truth in the situation uh, in the Middle East and to continue to, to be a, a seeker and a learner and a listener and, um, and somebody who's going to be an activist. So uh, you guys activated me <laughs> in that area. Thank you. And by Malik, um, Nikki means Jamil's husband, Malik, not Malik Nassar. <laughs> you know, <laughs> no, I haven't met Malik yet. Some going on. <laughs> yeah, no, I, uh, I grew up in a, a Lebanese Druze household that was very pro-Palestinian. However, we have rel relatives and friends in Israel who are very pro-Israeli. They're part of the, the government itself. So there was this, you know, being Druze, you're, you're on different sides of that, that spectrum. So I heard both of those perspectives growing up. And, um, and then, uh, you know, being a theater maker, uh, I was just so intrigued by the play. And I'd written an article about Arab American theater because that was a topic I was interested in. And, and uh, talked to Jamil about that article. And then one thing led to another. We started working on this play. And the, it was a perfect merging between theatrical interest and political interest and really wanting to explore this issue in a much deeper way through theater and then working with amazing artists like yourselves. It just was the perfect, for me, uh, the perfect place to bring all of those threads together that had been in my life uh, growing up and uh, through the theater, through the politics, through my own family history, uh, through all the Palestinian friends I grew up with who uh, always, you know, fed us amazing food and inviting us to our, their homes. And, uh, and, and it was just this great exploration. And the rehearsal period for me was so rich because having both of you play all the roles uh, and switching between, you know, Palestinian characters, Jewish characters, that for me was also exciting because we did not cast it with a whole cast of, you know, whatever, nine characters. We instead, having, having you uh, both take on both of those, uh, all of those characters yourselves, I think made it so much more theatrical. And it was just a great uh, tribute to Jamil's writing and your performing abilities to take on these roles and to play them so in such a beautiful way in such a such a, a vibrant alive way i'll just never forget that it was it was truly a transformal transformative moment in my life uh both both as a as an arab american as a theater maker and also as uh, somebody who just loves working with and collaborating with artists and I have some of, of the costume designs right behind me here from the original production as well that was done by uh, uh, Livia O'Corn. So I was able to pull those out a little bit and show those as well. Very cool. I'd, I'd, I'd love to see those close up, but I just also want to thank you as the director of Precious Stones for drawing the best out in us. Mm -hmm. Well, I honestly, I ask, I think we we're all asking a lot of both of you and you both stepped up in a big way. And I know it was hard. I know, I know that, you know, we weren't, you know, we weren't working in some massive luxurious theater. You know, we were really doing that sort of uh, the theater that, that was, that was very immediate, you know, like Peter Brook would call it the immediate theater. And I think that's what we were doing, a very immediate type of theater that really called upon us to, to pull off the creativity that all of us had inside of us. And I'm grateful to the both of you for really sticking with it and making it happen, even though it, it was not always easy. Uh, it was it was one of the hardest things I think I've ever done theatrically. I think physically, emotionally, uh, mentally, it, it was in every single way. And I know we did. We struggled so many times. And um, and that space was such a funky little space, but it was magical. It was really like, it felt like we were in a laboratory a lot of the time. And, um, and it just, it, you know, getting to, getting to play the different parts, getting to, to take on those different characters and sort of pit our our own personal selves against one another. And then working with you, you know, which was so like, you know, like, <laughs> I just remember just being so in it all the time to, um, to always come to the end of the play where I felt like I just lost it every night, you know, when we were, we were in our military garb or our fighting garb and just, um, I can still, I bring that up. And I think looking at you, Roxanne, across the stage and having to hold that piece where you had the rock and I had the rifle and it was so, it was really hard. 
it was really, it was, I'm so grateful ever, ever, ever for that because you, you brought, you were able to bring that out in us. Malik and, and Jamil, the piece, it was so talky, it was so heady and yet mm. it was so embodied. Maybe and, I can and, read a review, Jamil, before, uh, oh, I yeah. got a bit of a review here from Gay Chicago Magazine. And I'm just gonna read a very quick excerpt. Uh, playwright Jamil Hoori has created a script that poignantly examines a great deal of perspectives on numerous loaded issues with incredible clarity and humanity. Roxana Sepp and Nicole Pittman are wonderful as not only our politically and sexually charged lovers, but also as all the other characters in the cast as well. Um, Michael Najard superbly directs this two-woman multi-character play. A less competent director and actors would have stumbled over this script, but they deliver it almost flawlessly. Even the scene that opens the second act where the two women play six characters in a hysterical <laughs> and almost disastrous party of errors, these women depict a delightful level of sexual tension and chemistry together, exclamation point. Wow. That's good. I'm glad you reread that. <laughs> Thank yeah, you. Yeah, Roxanne, for... I'll never forget your dancing. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and, and, and it should be uh, pointed out that, that both uh, Roxanne and Nicole were each playing three characters. So that, that total of six characters, and of course all six came together in that first scene of the second act, uh, and and you know a, a a choice that was made early on was that um, you know Nicole who was playing the, the the primary Jewish character Andrea would also play two Palestinian characters and Roxanne who was playing the primary Palestinian character Layla would also play two uh, Jewish characters and so you know th there was also a a a, a deliberate you know uh, political. Uh, rationale behind those choices and hearing the same actors embody these different characters with very different politics. Uh, I, 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 I believe really not only strengthened the, the process, but the experience for audiences, because we, we, we received that feedback repeatedly, you know, just how interesting it was to see the actors switching. So, so seamlessly into, um, you know, these very contrarian characters in 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 many respects. And I always consider yeah. the narrator to be to make it round out at eight characters because you get you give the audience a break from the drama of the individual personalities often at odds with each other to just hear a stand and deliver portion of the play. And I like that um, choice because it permitted a lot of information to come across, to put things into perspective and to, into context that wouldn't have been possible in a two and a half hour play. It would have taken seven and a half hours to play through all of that. So the narration portion, which each of us had to deliver at points, it made it a really fulsome experience for anybody coming to that buffet. I also think that the the other four characters, right? Not Andrea and Layla, but the other, you know, the other two that we each played were a little bit more mm, caricature, like caricature, a little bit more blown up. And so, in that sense, in there, and there, they were reality based, but there was something about that that the the reality was Andrea and Layla. Right. right, and that these these characters were very real and very true, but they were so one-sided, mm -hmm. and we were trying yeah. to get our two main characters were really trying to get closer to the truth, and then it would just, you oh, know, right. it was so potent that way. Mm -hmm. And a real and a real testament to your ability to switch so quickly, especially in that that banquet scene or the the dinner scene, uh, and and uh, that you know it it, it was. I, I just loved how willing you were to play. I mean, I think that's just wonderful. You're creative and you were both so willing to play and, and go there. And by doing that, I think it really, it, it was this moment of real deep empathy that we all had to experience where we were jumping into the, to the lives and souls of others, whether we agreed with their political positions or not. And yet taking that in and experiencing that, embodying that, I think also help the audience to make that empathetical leap as well into the point of view of the other, because too often that is what's missing in this entire conflict is we're just not willing to empathize with the other side. 
And how do we make that radical empathy possible? And I think theater is one of the great ways to do that. Mm -hmm. I, I just want to add to uh, to what Nicole was saying. You know, those four characters <laughs> were so much fun to write mm -hmm. uh, because they sort of, you know, based on the, you know, the just by the virtue of this structure and the the role that the roles that they played, I could say a lot of outrageous things yeah. uh, and things that you know were probably very offensive. Uh, but there's so much offense taken, you know, within just the broader discourses around Israel Palestine, um, that uh, uh, yeah, I, 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 there was something almost something playful there, uh, and and that you know, Andrea and Layla were coming together on this intellectual, political, spiritual, you know, sexual, romantic, uh, and and we could we could explore that that sort of subtextual. Uh, you know, energy uh, that was propelling so much. It takes certain genius to be able to write humor into such a freighted topic. Yeah. You did that handily. Yeah. yeah, bravo. Thank you. This is a question for all of you. And so I'd love to know, um, what is it do you think about this play and this production that resonates with audiences. And um, secondly, what made this production unique from other live theater productions that were happening in Chicago at the time? Hmm. Well, that last I part is just that it was driven by 9-11. So if I had my students in front of me right now, I would ask them to try to conjure a sense of the context in which Silk Road Theater Project, now Silk Road Rising, was born. Mm -hmm. and, and when you put yourself into that moment and, and the motivation of Jamila and Mali to found something because they saw the vilification of Arabs and Muslims as a result of the destruction of the buildings in downtown New York and the tensions internationally. You had a United States public that never really even used the word Muslim, Muslim. Muslim, however you want to say it, there wasn't a great awareness, but then it politicized people to the point where they started showing up at their job at FedEx, doing data entry, wearing a hijab. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know what, I'm going to stand and represent and represent my people, I'm not going to hide this. And they might not have been hiding it before, but there was a need to go sort of in your face. And so that's the moment in which Jamil wrote this play. So I, my takeaway for that, for students in this setting today in 2023, is to do a little bit of research surrounding elements in the attack on Iraq that was the false narrative that made the United States public sit on their hands when we did that thing, horrible thing on false pretexts. Uh, so Jamil was ahead of the game because he was thinking about this right as those buildings came down in New York. I, I think we we just perhaps instinctively knew that the terrible representation that really, you know, dominated from the time I was a child and certainly, you know, be before then, either the demonization of Arabs and Muslims or uh, fetishization or exotic, you know, ex exoticization, all of that, um, that there had to be an intervention or interventions and that we would, we would somehow be a part of that. And, and that, you know, it, it starts with the stories that we hear. Um, and so, you know, we never wanted uh, to portray what we call Silk Road peoples, you know, Asian, Middle Eastern, North African, um, as, as angels. We didn't want to portray people as demons. We wanted to portray people who were leading, you know, complicated three-dimensional lives like we all do. Um, and finding that space or creating that space. And we were, we were so hoping that it would catch on, you know, that other companies would start producing this work and uh, that, uh, you know, other companies would emerge. And of course, 
you know, Golden Thread Productions in San Francisco was already uh, doing this work. And, uh, and, and I have to say that fast forwarding 20 years, um, no, things aren't where we want them to be, but we've come a long way. <laughs> and, you know, it's, it's really been so gratifying for so many of us to see. I'm, I'm, I'm speaking of the spring in Chicago as an Arab spring of Chicago theater, uh, because there have been so many plays, including one that Roxanne just finished, a, a, a beautiful solo piece, The Shroud Maker. So, you know, we, we want to think that we've been part of, of helping to build an ecosystem um, and, you know, really changing the story, cha shifting the narrative. And so much of that is about owning one's own narrative. Um, and, and that was the direction that we wanted to go. And so, you know, Precious Stones as an inaugural project, um, you know, in, in, when we look at our history, it, it, I can say it made a lot of sense because it, it was the catalyst for many other stories to come. Uh, and, and I'm not saying that in a self-congratulatory way because, you know, I, I wrote the play, but it, it, it sort of set a... Um, uh, you know, a, a, a established a whole series of, of questions that we wanted to work with, uh, and that you know continued as we as we worked with new playwrights, new stories, and so forth. Just going to tack on that it was a wedge for gay issues that are still considered to be revolutionary today. Just in the play um, La Yalina that just happened on the stage with Arabs who were you know they're dealing with queer issues in a way that still seems groundbreaking. And you think Jamil was doing that 20 years ago. I'm sorry, go ahead, Nikki. Oh no, I just, you know, and I also, where where the play was produced was at um, the Chicago Cultural Center, which used to be the library. Um, and it's known as the People's Palace. And I, I, I kind of think that that's a really beautiful, yeah. wonderful space of, it was for everybody. And there's so much to grapple with in the play. And I think that though, I think, I think that a lot of a lot of people were 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 very like tentative and interested at the same time. Like it was like get the foot in the door and then come. And, and what was wonderful is I can't remember how often it was, but it was at least every week, I think we had a talk back mm -hmm. after the show. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and set, and there were people that would come like that would come several times. Cause there was so much to pick apart in the play. There was so much like, wait, I missed that. I want to understand that better. Or I stayed for a discussion. I wanted to come back for more of the discussion. And I thought that was what was not that that doesn't happen in Chicago theater because Chicago theater is rich that way, but there was something about that space and about the audience and that interaction, because as, as Roxanne talked about, is there was a lot of face forward throughout the play of explanation, but there was also that face forward scene at the at the dinner where it was like, right, where it was really everybody was in it. And because the space itself was small, and because it wasn't, it was a makeshift stage, it was a platform put together, and we had this funky, remember those funky walls? Like Roxanne and I were never together backstage. Yeah. Ever. Because we had like these bizarre little backstage places where we would go run and change and I'd be like oh, and I'd come back <laughs> on it there was there was something very differently dynamic about that mm -hmm. I think all of those pieces together um it just really it was a different kind of gave it a different framework and and in well, comparison to other plays that were going on in Chicago at the time I mean I remember seeing Christopher Plummer and Barrymore right the, the plays were you know, they were American plays and they were talking about those kinds of issues, but this play was unique. I mean, this play was talking about the here, the now, what's going on in Israel, Palestine, what's happening in Chicago with the diaspora, um, bringing up the, the queer issues that were brought up in the play. It was, it was, there was a lot to unpack. And I felt that it was a special moment. It was at the right place at the right time. And that, and you're right, Nikki, that, that space was just a, a great, uh, a great uh, workshop slash embryo for this kind of discussion. And the reason that I think it was also so striking was it was not overproduced. You know, that you could take a play like this and throw millions and millions of dollars and overproduce it. But the truth is it was about the two people having this vital 
uh, discussion in front of us, like 20 feet in front of us. There was no denying it, no going away from it. And then the post-show talks were just very, uh, very rich as well. So it became much bigger than just doing a play. It became an event and it became something that really resonated long beyond. And that's why I felt the need to publish it in this anthology. And also I teach it in my classes and students still to this day have such um, really passionate feelings about it and, and uh, how, how they, they react to it as well. So uh, it's a testament to the lasting power of your writing, Jamil, but also to, the, to that, that, that spark that I think we set in that one space at that time. What was always so moving for us was the number of people who had seen uh, Precious Stones and then invested in the company in, in whatever way that would be, you know, who would come to all you know, the successive, you know, um, productions, staged readings, so forth, that it, it, it did have that, uh, that effect from an institutional or an organizational place of, uh, of, of bringing in, you know, a, a, a very diverse group of individuals who said, okay, I want to, I want to continue on this path with this company and to see people, um, you know, up, up until, you know, the, the pandemic and then, you know, a lot shifted to zoom, but, you know, who had been with us from those early days, uh, you know, from a producing perspective was just, just enormously, you know, gratifying and validating and, you know, all, all of that. Um, and that hunger for stories that were not being told elsewhere, you know, that hunger for stories that people are, and perspectives and experiences that audiences were not being exposed to. And we would say to theater companies all the time, you know, give your audiences more credit <laughs> uh, and give people the benefit of the doubt. Don't assume what they can handle and not handle or what they're able to connect with and not, you know, connect with. And uh, we felt really because of the Precious Stones experience that we had a certain permission to to go to these places that others said, oh, no, 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 no one's going to like that. No one wants to hear that. That's too, it's too out there. It's too, you know, foreign. It's too whatever. Um, and, I, you know, I, I think we all have a responsibility to just keep pushing, you know, whatever that envelope may be um, and, and trust our audiences uh, and, and, you know, and, and trust that they can handle what we are putting, you know, in front of them. It, yeah. it wasn't a safe, oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> it, I, I just want to say it wasn't a safe place to start, perhaps. Right. Yeah. I think that, you know, what I used to say to my kids in when I was teaching is this isn't necessarily a safe space. I'll make it as safe for you as possible, but it's a brave space. This yeah. is where we, we come to be brave. Yes. I like yes. that. And it was a brave play. I mean, putting all Very that out. There. Even today, I think, uh, you know, 20 years later, obviously the situation has not gotten better in Israel, Palestine. If anything, it seems to have gotten worse. And so uh, it's still a brave play because it, uh, it, the themes then are the themes now. And they're, they're somewhat timeless in many ways. Yeah. yeah. Well, we have just a few moments left. So I was hoping we could close out our conversation with just one more question for Jamil. Um, Jamil, how would you say that the production of Precious Stones has impacted the trajectory of the company? Well, I mean, you know, what 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 I, I had said, I mean, I think that it just, uh, uh, you know, once again, it gave us that green light and it gave us the that that will <laughs> to to continue you know we we saw that we could do it and you know Malik and I were not theater producers we were coming from different worlds professionally and and so forth and we kind of taught ourselves how to produce I mean I remember Malik saying well you need a stage manager you need this you know sort of spelling out you know it was like producing theater 101 you know <laughs> this kind of thing and so we were oh okay I guess yeah oh that's right we would need a lighting designer that makes sense you know and and so we really were just learning as as we were um as we were doing it 
Um, and it, it did give us, uh, it did give us confidence. Um, and, and I think things, you know, Malik had shared the, the Gay Chicago Review. I mean, we the, the play won the After Dark Award, which unfortunately they're they're no longer with us. The After Dark Awards, but that that was um, an, an annual award show produced by Gay Chicago Magazine, um, and it, it won outstanding new work. And you know, to to have that kind of I don't know blessing from you know, the, the 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 theater community. Um, was I, I think we needed it. I think everyone needs that. You know that sense that okay, this can become a thing. This this can work, um, but also that idea that we would gravitate towards what you know were sometimes described as edgier plays or you know plays that were you know overtly political in ways that you know may alienate some audiences or may. Um, and and I never felt those constraints that I would I would hear from other artistic directors like oh I can't touch this or I can't go near this or you know um, uh, and and that that is a gift and uh, you know I, I I think that empowered us and and the bravery of doing that over and over because so many plays like this get shut down even today so yeah. i i think that uh it's great that you're you're willing to take that chance and that your your patrons and audiences are willing to go there with you i think that's a great testament to the company and all the work that you've produced since i mean i've had the blessing to drop in several times since that time to silk road rising and, and have projects there and every time it's that same energy that same spirit of wanting to create something that is not safe, but rather, as you said, Nikki Bray. Well, and even from the get-go, you, you had a pretty big corporate sponsor. You had Subway that was That's our right. corporate sponsor because we had Subway every night for dinner. <laughs> Subway every was kind enough to offer us sandwiches, weren't they? <laughs> That's great. Well, that, that, I think that was really cool. I mean, you had backing. You had you actually had such good backing from the get-go. You know that somebody said we 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 want to we want to support this well i'm i have to credit malik 100 percent for for subway uh, <laughs> so you know he 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 pursued that and he yeah was able to secure that yeah let's not forget malik's but, contribution no, to all oh, of this yeah I mean, really my god my god absolutely instrumental to so much of what's happened with silk road rising and so blessings to him always always thank you yeah, no, this is very much a partnership <laughs> and a community and a collaboration. And I and I think, you know, Liz, to your question, it it also helped us understand what collaborative art making is about and what collaborative art making can uh can be, and that we could take, you know, this very simple, essentially a room in the cultural center, uh, and and turn it into this this experience that um, that we all want to talk about and that other people have been talking about 20 years later. When you go into that space, now that it's not a theater and it looks like it's just a room with some overhead lighting, it's impossible to believe that we created that universe. Yeah. And it was a yeah. theater with yeah. bright lights and people in costume and the music, the sound. We all wanted to take a copy of that soundtrack home with yeah. us. Yeah, yeah the butterfly. sound was beautiful. Any sound that sounds like that soundtrack, my stomach gets all like I'm standing in the wings ready to go. It was it was such a joy putting that together. I mean, I remember just the contributions, the different ideas, and then bringing all those songs together for each scene transition and creating a soundscape, really, of, of yeah. Israeli music, of, of Palestinian music, of different... Uh, musics from different places that really I felt also told that story because as we all know our cultures are all about music and 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 the the joy and and the, of course the pain that that uh, those songs express it was it was lovely I want to pick up on something that Nicole Pittman said earlier in this conversation <clears throat> describing this as a brave space is to me, correct on every count that we've all talked about, from the historical, the religious, the gay, to 
you know, whether or not you're ever going to get funding for humanizing the human beings that Palestinians are. But I think I came to understand that it was fairly simple to pick up as an activist and embed yourself with people of every stripe who were hip to the Palestinian situation. And a lot of those people doing that courageous work are Jewish. And many of them are Israeli Jews. And so I might have made an assumption that my co-actor on this project was going to be like so many people that I met whose lives were basically driven by this issue of humanizing the Palestinians so that the rest of the world can stop either ignoring them or killing them or crushing them or buying into the United States support of the crushing of Palestinians abroad. And in comes Nicole Pittman, who was not embedded in the activist community of already informed Jews. Nicole was very much an open-minded person, attempting to be fair-minded while also having the ear of her father, rest in peace, who was kind of mainstream from a Jewish perspective, if I'm not mistaken. And I think for Nicole to be in this circle, she's, she was at least at that moment outnumbered by people <laughs> who were just ready to go. There was a little part of Michael Najjar, Malik Najjar, who had been a little bit pounded upon by his father who was angry about this issue for a <laughs> very good reason. But when you're a child and you're with a parent who's angry about something, you have a tendency to be like, what if we weren't angry about that? What would life be like? And so Michael Najjar was willing to not be so angry about that. So I was angry about it. Malik was angry about it. And Jamil was angry about it. So I'm glad that, that Michael and Nicole had each other in that middle space. <laughs> it's also good for the whole play to have people who were not coming from being inculcated into this culture and mindset. Because, I mean, I'm coming from spending a year under Israeli occupation in the West Bank, and my heroes were Jewish Israelis who were refuseniks, young adults who were required to serve in the Israeli army, but refused. They'd go to prison for it. My people were Chicago Jews who'd started organizations like not in my name. So I thought everybody was like that, that I was about to meet. And you have this very courageous actor who brings a lot of technique and a lot of, you had your own acting school, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, well, I was teaching and we had a theater company, yeah. Theater company. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that was very impressive to me. And still to this moment makes me feel privileged that Nicole stuck with this and brought her whole skin and heart and soul into the into the game. She was in it to win it. Well, and, and, and both of you just were, what I loved was it wasn't like when you work with certain actors who are just focused on the, the character and that's pretty much it. Like, but both of you brought in so much of your life experience, so much of your activism, so much of your history. And that's why those characters came alive in such an incredibly three-dimensional way. I mean, that was, a testament to both of you for having spent your lives thinking through these things and working through these things and and for me that was that was why those those uh, characters were so vibrant and and every night they just you know leapt off the stage the way they did and i you know i i grew up with strong women and spending time with two strong women in that in that rehearsal process was such a joy because you brought it and it was you know made my made my job so much not quote unquote easier but rather it was it went beyond just blocking and you know aesthetics it went into the the real personal uh and political that we were all dealing with at that time of course well and i felt like too you know malik you would step back a lot you would just let us like you know and 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 roxanne you pushed me you pushed me so hard and i would be like yeah, you know, I remember <laughs> just having like some big blow ups a lot, but also just so, so much love. There was so much love in that that space and um, and so much room, you know, in these small space, these actual physical spaces that we use that forced us to be together, yeah. you know, and and to really grapple not just with our characters, not just with our acting work, but with our issues, 
and um and 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 the bigger issues and i think because we were all there i do believe we were all there for a greater purpose you know that it there was the the ego part was that was beside the point it was just like i'm trying to understand my place here i'm trying to understand our place in the world what are we doing (laughs) and you know i just i can i can remember that first night was like for the performance because we had been through so much already. That's we had true. already been through so right. much. And then with the run of the show, we we found, as you do most of the time, if you're really in it, is it grows, it morphs, it changes, you know? And and every night there was something. There was something. I do think that being separated and not being able to see each other, you know, during the show was added to that, that tension, which was great. And, you know, a fan club emerged for, for both of you or fan clubs or however we want to. Uh, I mean, it was it was also something so powerful to to, to see. And, uh, you know, the, the last, I don't know, four or five weeks of the seven week run, we were we were selling out. You know, our houses were all sold out. And, you know, we we had people in, in one case, literally, she pushed her way into the the theater uh <laughs> even you know after we said we don't have any seats and she stood and watched because it had this kind of word of mouth and um and it really resonated with the lesbian community and and that was also something just so meaningful for us to experience you know i mean i think i think it, it resonated with 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 Jewish community, I mean, there was certainly Arab audience. There were people who were interested in the conflict, but also seeing the lesbian community take the type of ownership of this play and this production um, was was uh, you know it, very significant. And and so I, I I think you became lesbian icons, uh, <laughs> you know, in the in the in the course of this run, and uh, that that was a, an unanticipated joy. Uh, so thank you. I'll make sure to tell my husband that after. <laughs> <laughs> well, we are just about out of time. Um, I want to thank everyone for participating in today's conversation and for joining us as we look back to where it all began. Um, so to learn more about Silk Road Rising, please visit our website at www.silkroadrising.org or follow us on social media. So thank you all for helping our world heal and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you.